Welcome to the Gastro Girl Podcast. We bring together patients, experts, and health advocates who are all here to help you optimize your health. Here's your host, Jacqueline Gollin. Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of the Gastro Girl Podcast. Today we're going to focus on a really interesting uh, research article that was recently published in the American Journal of Gastroenterology involving EOE, eosinophilic esophagitis, and it looks at the the demographics and whether EOE patients um, of Hispanic or Latinx ethnicity or non-white race have differences in presentation at diagnosis or whether or not they respond differently to topical steroid treatments. This episode is brought to you by Sanofi Regeneron, and we have an amazing expert guest today. We have Dr. Evan Dellen, who is professor of medicine and adjunct professor of epidemiology at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine in Chapel Hill. He's also the director of the UNC Center for Esophageal Diseases and Swallowing. Dr. Dellen, so great to have you on the show today. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Well, I was fascinated with your um, recent article, and I said, oh, I would love to speak with you about this. Um, It's so timely for two reasons. Um, As you know, more and more people seem to be diagnosed with EOE. Um, And then, you know, just understanding what barriers there are to, to diagnosis and treatment in all healthcare, but you looked at it for EOE, like, are there some differences? Um, So we thought we'd be, we'd have you on and ask you some questions about your um, study. Sure. So, you know, this study was done um, with our uh, database of newly diagnosed patients um, here at uh, University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And it was led by one of the medical students, actually, Adolfo Ocampo, who's the first author. And a number of the students and residents helped to obtain the data and, and work on this paper. So it's it's quite a collaborative uh, project and um, I want to make sure that they, they get credit for that. Um, but, but really what was driving um, the, this paper was twofold. One was looking at are the presenting features – or EOE different in patients of different ethnic um, racial minorities. And um, based on that, are the outcomes different for the response to topical steroids? There are a few papers that are that have looked at clinical features and uh, have found some differences, and really not many at all have looked at treatment outcomes. And I think when we generally think about sort of the prototypical EOE patient, it's going to be a young male, generally white, who's having a lot of trouble swallowing and getting food impactions. And, you know, that that is, if you look over the most studies, sort of the predominant presentation, but it's not at all the only one. And the thinking is, is that perhaps in other populations, the symptoms may present differently, the severity may be differently. And if providers aren't thinking about the possibility of EOE as a diagnosis in those other po- populations, it may be missed because, um, you know, they may not get biopsies of the esophagus or they may, may not consider the diagnosis. Yeah, and that's really important because, as I understand it, there can be up to a 10-year delay in diagnosis. Is that true in minority populations or underserved populations as well, or is it longer? So it, it is, and it's, it's actually true across the board. Now, part of that is related to um, physician awareness, but I think over the last you know, five to 10 years with all the increasing recognition of EOE, if someone comes to a provider with typical um, you know, presentation, with trouble swallowing, they're going to go down a pathway and get diagnosed. I think what, what part of it is, is that patients really cope with their symptoms and adjust to them and put up with them for years before something happens or they come in and, and happen to tell providers about it. So it's a combination of patients not recognizing what their symptoms are. And, you know, again, for trouble swallowing, it may be, hey, I just took too big of a bite, then I've got to eat more carefully. Um, and then, you know, they just don't come in. Um, or it's the providers not necessarily, you know, thinking about about the condition. Now, it's interesting, we'll have some data coming out up at um, DDW this year, which will be in in May. And um, one of the fellows actually looked at the diagnostic delay or time from symptom onset to diagnosis um, throughout different racial and ethnic groups. And interestingly, and I would say reassuringly, it it is not longer in those groups. It's sort of equally long <laughs> across, across <laughs> so all groups. So it's still not, it's still too long, <laughs> it's, but it's, it's not still too longer. Long, but it doesn't seem to be dependent on on race and ethnicity. Now, the other thing is, is probably the delay is, is less in children. 
Because again, it's parents seeing what's happening to their kids and taking the kids to the doctor and, and moving that evaluation forward, as opposed to an adult, you know, balancing, trying to go to the doctor with all the other things that they have going on. Now, before we get into the key findings, I just wanted to level set for our audience who may not know um, what EOE is, just a brief uh, definition of EOE, and then uh, what symptoms. So if people are listening to this and you said they may not recognize the symptoms, uh, you know, if you could just touch on that before we get into the findings to put in some context. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So EOE is a chronic allergic problem of the esophagus. And you could think about it as asthma of the esophagus or eczema of the esophagus. Um, so different allergens, whether it's food or environmental allergens, will get into the esophagus and trigger an inf you know, a lot of inflammation and irritation. And so that's what happens with EOE. And then the symptoms really depend a little bit on the age and also how long the disease has been present. So usually in adolescents and adults where probably there's been longer amounts of inflammation, the most common symptom is trouble swallowing. And so people may feel food gets stuck. Um, they may feel food go down slowly. Those are abnormal feelings. Um, you know, it's, it's even for people who take a large bite of food, if you're normal and have a normal esophagus, it won't get stuck. And so if, if people are feeling that repetitively, having to eat slowly, um, that's something to get checked out with their doctor. And people often um, almost subconsciously will adapt their eating. They'll eat slow, more slowly, take smaller bites, drink lots of fluid with every meal, maybe even avoid meats or breads that might stick. And because of that, you know, the symptoms can persist for a long time. Um, now, in, in younger kids, it's different symptoms. So in babies, it might be poor growth, um, also called failure to thrive. Some babies have feeding difficulty. They'll refuse foods or won't move up from, say, stage two to stage three baby foods where they start getting solids. And then for, you know, school-age kids, it's going to be more abdominal pain, vomiting, regurgitation, even heartburn. So those are sort of how the symptoms change. And of course, there are hundreds of things in, in GI and medicine that can cause those symptoms. So there's nothing specific about a symptom like that being from EOE, but those are the symptoms that you can see in the condition. No, and thank you. And I'd just like to tell our audience that we've done a number of episodes, uh, EOE 101, and we've done pediatrics. So we have a whole playlist uh, that you can refer to that expands on what Dr. Dellen um, just highlighted here. But now I'd really like to get into um, the results of the study and what were the key findings that uh, the study um, came up with? Sure. So the study was kind of broken into two parts. The first part was looking at um, Hispanic or Latinx patients because there's really relatively very uh, few studies on that group. And we had more than a thousand patients in the study and only 2% were Hispanic. And so, you know, just from that finding, either it's less common in that group or that group is less likely to come to medical attention and less likely to get assessed for EOE. Um, but within that small number of patients, there weren't that many differences in the presentation. Um, in other words, the kind of symptoms um, and findings on the endoscope um, that they had compared to, say, the non-Hispanic population were, were pretty similar. And it was really hard because it was just 20 or 25 patients to look in a cohesive manner at how they do with those topical steroid therapies. In general, it seemed like it was pretty similar. Um, but again, hard to tell because it was just, you know, such few numbers. Now, I will say there are other studies that have been um, published specifically in um, areas that have very high proportion of Hispanic um, patients, particularly, say, Arizona, Southern Florida, and they see higher rates of EOE in those patients. And so if you start looking for it, um, you're likely going to find it if you're in an area um, where, where higher proportions of those patients are. Or if you're listening to this and you happen to be Hispanic or Latinx yourself, you know, there's, uh, you know, and you have allergies and you have these kind of symptoms, it, it makes sense to get checked out for EOE. Now, the second part of the study um, was that we looked at um, white EOE patients compared to EOE patients of other races. And that group was about 13% of the total, again, of just over 1,000 patients that we looked at total. And in that situation, there were differences in the presentation. And the, the patients with other races um, were younger. Um, when they were diagnosed, they were less likely to have health insurance. Um, 
they had different kinds of symptoms. So less trouble swallowing and less food impaction and more symptoms of, say, vomiting. Um, and when we looked on the endoscopy, some of the findings were less prominent or, or more subtle. Um, particularly, there were less strictures. So again, that's the kind of situation where if there isn't the classic trouble swallowing food impaction, the diagnosis might not be thought of. Then when we looked forward at the proportion of patients, which was almost 500 patients who were treated with steroids, um, the patients who were of non-white uh, race had a much lower treatment response. It was about 41% compared to 59%. And we looked at treatment response in terms of, you know, the biopsies getting better primarily. And that lower response rate um, held even after we controlled for different confounders like um, health insurance and other things that we had found that might predict treatment, like having a dilation in the esophagus, how much steroid they were on, how long they had been symptomatic, um, and even trying to get at um, uh, social determinants of health, such as the uh, median income in the zip code in which someone lived. So even controlling for all of those factors, we still saw a lower histologic response. And so that's one of the main findings. That's very interesting. So in terms of what patients need to know, you know, how can we, how can patients apply this uh, in their own healthcare journey? And you know, do they take this to the doctor? They does it. How does it help them? How do you, what would be the key takeaway for the patients to know here? Yeah, no, it's it's a great question, and I think the first thing is is to be aware of this that there are, you know, differential responses, and we don't exactly know why why those are. You know, if you would say it's just because you don't have insurance, or it's just because you might be in an area with lower income, then when we did the statistics, we should have seen that difference go away. So, are there things about the way treatment is communicated? Are there things about actually getting the medicines or being able to take them on a continuous basis that, that may be an issue? And this, this actually applies to, to really all patients. Um, but, you know, it's, it's critical to, to know the treatment, understand why you're taking it, ask questions about it, and make sure it seems like something that you can actually, tr actually take. There's, there's some patient papers coming out now um, that shows, you know, for EOE, just like other conditions, sticking to the treatment uh, regimen is pretty hard. Yeah, I was going to ask you, was there any control for if, if a patient was treatment compliant and adhered to the treatment plan, you know, in the different groups? Because that could be a factor. You think they're on the, the, the steroids, but they're really not doing it consistently what the doctor it, told them. Exactly. And that, that was really hard to tell from this particular yeah. study because we were looking back at all the charts. And most of the times you can't get a sense you can have a C that the prescription is given, uh, but you really don't have the detail about whether they're whether they're taking the medications or not. Um, but you know this this was also um, all of these treatments were done, you know, before I think 2021, say, and so certainly before we had any of the approved treatments for EOE, and, and of course you know the topical steroids in the U.S. only got approved last month. And so everybody in the study had to mix their own topical steroids using the off-label variety or swallowing from an inhaler. And that makes it really hard, I think, to stick with the medicines, especially, you know, if, if you're busy and running around and doing stuff. Well, that's a great segue to my next question. You know, I know there's been some advances in the treatment options on the, both the pediatric side and the adult side. You know, we always like to give our patients, you know, hope and uh, information that they can be empowered to have these conversations uh, and share decision making with their provider. So could you just give a little overview of, you know, what the landscape looks like for maybe someone's getting diagnosed or they're, they know they, they probably may have this and they're, they, they want to know what their options could be in terms of managing this because it's a progressive disease, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think just like with asthma, you know, it's, there are excellent treatments and they can keep people under control, but we, you know, unfortunately don't have a cure yet for the condition. So I would say the first distinction patients need to make is whether they want to try to go towards diet elimination and see if the EOE is actually food triggered or if they want to go down um, on the medicine route. And the diet thing, I'm sure that's a whole other long yeah. podcast that we could. Yeah, we have. <laughs> we we've done them and they're very yeah. interesting and it's yeah. tough, as you know. Very yeah, tough. Yeah, absolutely. And that, so, you know, right now, the main um, medicine treatments, if you're just starting out with a new diagnosis, you're mostly looking at probably a, a proton pump inhibitor. So a medicine like omeprazole, um, which is off-label, it's not approved for EOE, um, but it works by decreasing some of the factors that draw eosinophils into the esophagus and making the esophageal barrier more healthy and, and tighter. Um, 
And many people start with that first. Um, the other main option has been a topical steroid. And the concept here is you're swallowing this medicine to coat the esophagus and have an anti-inflammatory effect. And so up, up until you know last month, everybody, you had to take asthma medicines and adapt them. And so the newest um, news is that um, last month, a budesonide, which is a, a type of steroid, um, was approved for EOE in a formulation that's a premixed syrup um, of a standard concentration, no mixing or anything like that. And it was it was approved by the FDA in patients 11 years and older. Um, the dose that was approved was two milligrams twice a day, and it was approved for an initial 12 week course. And of course, that raises the, both the dose and the timing you know, raises some additional questions. But the, for the first time, we actually have something that we can prescribe where I as a provider know what a patient is going to get. And a patient can just easily open up the, the little um, tube and swallow it and, and take their medication dose. So it's, it's really exciting. It was a long time coming um, with the research studies that had to, uh, to lead to that. Now, what's the, not the brand name, but what's the name of the, the drug? For it's that? called, it's a budesonide oral suspension. And so budesonide is the type of steroid. It acts topically and it's broken down a lot, like 90% or more. So very little is getting into the system. And I try to you know describe the concept to people as like you're rubbing cortisone on a bug bite. It sticks on there and it kind of takes away redness and inflammation. And so it's it's a very um, it's a very good medicine for for an initial uh, course to see if you respond. Are there any other options out there for patients to know about? Yeah, yeah. And so the other news is that um, dupilumab, which is a biologic, has been approved actually for um, patients twelve and above with EOE since twenty twenty two, and then just in January was approved for patients age one to eleven. So that's also big news. This is a medicine I'm sure your listeners know that's been approved for asthma and eczema and chronic sinus disease for a number of years. And it's been tested in EOE and it is quite effective. Um, it's a shot and it's a protein called an antibody. And that antibody blocks some of the allergic chemicals that we think cause EOE and also cause asthma and, and eczema. And, um, and so if you're 12 and above, it is a weekly shot. If you're one to 11, um, you also have to weigh at least 15 kilos, which is just over 30 pounds. Um, and it's a every other week shot. And the specific dose depends on the specific, the exact weight, but it's again, not, not a cure. And it's a medicine because it's an injection. I think most people are using it now for patients who, are not responding or not tolerating other treatments very well, or those patients who have many allergy conditions where this one medicine might substitute for four other treatments. Well, that's very interesting. Well, it's great news for patients that there are options out there from diet to steroids to biologics. Um, and, and it comes down to your conversation with your provider to see what's best for you. Absolutely. Great. So um, in summary, is there anything else, any tips for patients um, that you'd like to convey um, about EOE? Maybe they are struggling with some of these symptoms. They're afraid to see their doctor. Yeah, I think I think a couple of tips are, of course, if you're if you're having the symptoms, you know, get them checked out. Uh, we we have treatments now for for EOE that are effective for a lot of people, um, and that there are multiple treatments, so you will be able to find one that fits your life and lifestyle, and that the treatment may change over time depending on how your situation changes. Um, the other thing that's a really important point is, you know, again, think of EOE like asthma. If you have it, it's controllable, but you got to get checked out every so often. And, you know, with asthma, it's a little easier because you could say use the peak flow meter and breathe and, and see how your lungs are doing. With EOE, it does require periodic endoscopies to check and see how your esophagus looks and see what the biopsies are looking. So it, it is a it is a longer term process, um, but, you know, you partner with your with your provider provider and they'll come up with a plan that fits fits you. Well, this as always, it's so interesting and insightful. And I'm really looking forward to your continued research, especially in the area of diversity and what the differences are in presentation and outcomes in patients of, of various races. It's very fascinating. Well thank you so much. And a well, pleasure thank you so with much. You. Thank you for listening to the Gastro Girl Podcast. For more information and resources, please visit gastrogirl.com. Do you have a question for Gastro Girl? Please email podcast at gastrogirl.com. The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in the Gastro Girl podcast are not a substitute for medical advice from your healthcare professional. 
please consult a licensed clinician in your state regarding all matters related to your health.